Released by Santa Monica Studio in 2018 on the PlayStation 4, God of War, also called God of War 2018, would be the eighth game in the series and a sequel to God of War 3. Directed by Cory Barlog and written by Matt Sophos, Richard Zangrade Gaubert, and Cory Barlog, the game would pivot the direction of the series, writing a kinder and gentler Kratos raising his son in a loose Norse mythology setting, with major changes to combat to be more gear-focused in an over-the-shoulder style. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size of the recapitation. As the game begins, it has been many years since the former god of war defeated the Olympian Pantheon as he now lives in the realm of Midgard with his son Atreus. Pensively, Kratos now chops wood to build a funeral pyre for his second wife Faye, finding mementos of his past still weighing on his mind. Emotionally distant from his son, Kratos still keeps his past a secret from him and refers to him as boy, though as they return home, Atreus voices that he senses something different about the forest now. Conducting the final rites, the two Kree mate her as Atreus thinks to grab his mother's knife from the fire, and approvingly, Kratos hands down her knife to him now. Kratos also asks if Faye taught him how to hunt, and Atreus replies she taught him what she knew, and wishing to appraise his skills, the father tells him they are going hunting now. Armed with his bow and arrow, Atreus is told to hunt deer as Kratos explains he needs to know if Atreus can survive the journey Kratos intends to make for the highest peak in the realm to spread his wife's ashes. Atreus's impatience in hunting earns a scolding from his father, who tells him not to be sorry but to be better. However, the two are interrupted by a Draugr, who is swiftly dealt with by Kratos' frost magic infused leviathan axe. Learning to temper his own anger, Kratos tries more constructive guidance with Atreus, who responds better to the positive teaching. Helping him see through his hunt to the end, Kratos struggles to adjust to his more hands-on parenting role, but the kill is stolen by a troll that forces the two to work together to win the fight. Though Kratos easily wins, he observes his son is unable to control his emotions, deeming him unfit for the journey and declaring they are going home. Angrily, Atreus objects, but hearing none of it, they return home to find an alarming amount of Draugr and Reavers, unusually close to their home. Kratos collects the ashes of his wife, handling the sack with care, as he lectures Atreus on how to better control his anger in the midst of battle. He proves his point how easily the boy can get lost in his anger, but the two are interrupted by the sound of something large flying overhead. A sudden knock comes to their door, as a stranger calls out Kratos, claiming to know both who and what he is. Hiding Atreus, Kratos tries to turn away the man, but with a slap, the stranger challenges Kratos to a duel. Even though Kratos tries to hold back, the stranger blows back Kratos with surprising force, taunting him that his slow method of fighting is so boring while rapidly regenerating all damage inflicted. The stranger demands to know who Kratos is hiding in the house, and in response, Kratos explodes in Spartan rage, pushing back as best he can. As the two clash, the man tells Kratos that he cannot hide from Odin, and more to the point, his body cannot feel any of this no matter how hard Kratos tries. Not out of this fight yet, Kratos manages to get the stranger into a hold and snaps his neck, finally quieting him as Kratos limps back home. Speaking to himself, Kratos feels lost, calling out to Faye that their son is not strong enough to carry her ashes to the tallest mountain, and doesn't know how to raise him without her help. Retrieving Atreus, Kratos tells him they are leaving, regardless of his readiness, and Atreus is determined to prove himself. Setting their sights on the mountain ahead, Atreus notes there was actually a magic barrier set up around their woods with a small breach where Kratos was chopping Faye's specially marked trees. As they begin their journey, Kratos shares battle advice while Atreus displays his comprehension with multiple languages his mother taught him, like those of the giants, though sometimes he somehow has a grasp of languages he knows he doesn't know. Walking through some old giant settlements, they find shrines denoting important giant history and prophecies, though scavenging among the ruins are bandits and hungry reavers. Atreus is forced to kill other men in self-defense for the first time and is shaken from the ordeal, but Kratos firmly prevents his son from mentally giving up on their journey so soon, reminding him to show no mercy to any foes in their way. Soon enough, they encounter a dwarf struggling with his pack beast, and Atreus shows he is able to communicate with animals too, helping calm it and guide it forward. Mildly impressed, the foul-mouthed dwarf introduces himself as Brock, and then sees Kratos' axe, informing him he and his brother actually crafted it, proving it with his brand to the skeptical Spartan. As thanks for their help, he offers to maintain and upgrade it, and even Kratos recognizes the quality of his work. Back on the road, the mountain gets closer as Kratos still struggles being comfortable around his son, passing through a riddle gate and killing another troll beyond. They spot a chest with runes denoting the fates on it, which Kratos scoffs at, and Atreus takes aim at a boar, which seems to be magically tougher than normal. All the same, with more guidance, he is able to pierce his quarry, though drops his mother's knife in his eagerness. Kratos retrieves the blade, catching up to his son who is confronted by a witch who tells him the boar is her friend and demands they help save his life now. While she's upset they were hunting for target practice, she still uses her magic to provide first aid, and guides them to her home under a giant tortoise where they finish the healing. 
She sends Atreus to gather some herbs, and in private she reveals to Kratos she knows he is a god and not one from this realm, warning him the gods in this realm will find him and make his life difficult. She brings this up because she senses the boy doesn't know his lineage and what it entails, and Kratos tells her to mind her own business. Helping Atreus pick herbs, he hands him back his knife, and the boy is surprised he dropped it, promising to do better after a quick retort from his father. As the boar is saved, the witch thanks them by painting a sigil on them that will help ward them from the gods who pursue them, pointing them to a shortcut through the woods. As they take a boat on the way out, Atreus expresses how great the adventure has otherwise been, as for much of his life he was sick and bedridden. Exiting into more open waters, they pass by a statue of Thor that Kratos recognizes as he also describes a man who could feel no pain and Atreus believes him to be Baldur, son of Odin. They also read a message telling them to throw their weapons into the water to summon the Cradle of the World, and thinking it wouldn't be a problem for him, Kratos heaves the Leviathan Axe into the center of the lake. Strangely, his axe does not return like normal, as the boat is suddenly tossed aside as the World Serpent itself rises out of the depths and spits back his axe. Atreus is excited and tells Kratos his mother told him it was a friendly giant, and while the World Serpent speaks, he cannot understand what it says. The colossal creature pulls away for now, as the waters now recede, revealing more of the area surrounding the lake. Finding themselves next to a golden temple at the base of the mountain, they are spotted by Brock, though Atreus wonders how the dwarf got here when this temple just resurfaced. Chuckling as he sets up shop here, Brock tosses Kratos a key of Yggdrasil, which can open magic doors to the branches of the World Tree, fast traveling between the realms. Moving on, the pair pass through poison and pits, picking up fragments of a language cipher and run into another skittish dwarf who also recognizes the Leviathan Axe. Demanding to know why he has an axe that belonged to a woman he was fond of, Atreus explains it belonged to his mother before she passed on and gave it to his father. Saddened to hear of the loss, the dwarf introduces himself as Sindri, declaring he will make improvements to the axe even though no one asked him to, insisting he balance the work made by his brother Brock, clearly upset at him. Kratos allows him to improve the axe as Sindri mentions he was just fixing a transport up the mountain as part of an effort to mine resources. Starting their climb, Atreus asks to carry his mother's ashes for the last leg but is promptly denied as an ogre interrupts their talk, though Atreus has quickly grown more confident and capable already. Beyond, they find their path blocked by a strange black smoke and magically the witch appears behind them, saying the pure light of Alfheim is strong enough to pierce the corrupt fog. Kratos questions her motivation in helping them and she replies that she sees some of herself in him and wishes to make up for some past mistakes. With no choice but to take this detour, they follow the witch who explains Tyr's temple is at the center of the lake, and from there they can cross into Alfheim. In regards to the World Serpent, she adds it just appeared one day, and not even Thor's mighty attacks could defeat it, creating such a hatred between them that they are destined to kill each other come Ragnarok. She points out remnants of elven architecture still remaining, able to activate them thanks to her bow soaked in the life of Alfheim. She mentions other connected realms, like the poison magic they've encountered is Vanir from Vanaheim, who war with the Aesir, and some runes they pass are from the Fire Realm of Muspelheim and the Ice Realm of Niflheim. In addition, it was Tyr that traveled the Nine Realms in order to keep the peace, but these days something has disturbed the balance, causing a rise in undead as they make use of Kratos' strength to realign the bridge. Leading them to the Gate of Alfheim, she then gives Atreus her enchanted bowstring, telling him to recharge it in the light when they find it. Finally, she hands them a Bifrost to use as a key to travel between the realms, as well as capture and store the light they need. Explaining the role of Yggdrasil, the Nine Realms, and this room, the pathway opens for the travelers, though the path to Jotunheim disappeared a hundred years ago when the giants vanished from Midgard. However, when they enter Alfheim, the witch sees the light is diminished for some reason, but just then, magic that forces her to stay in Midgard activates and drags her back. With no way to go but forward, the pair finds themselves walking in the middle of a war between the light and dark elves. Atreus is suddenly struck with the pain of several voices in his head that only he can hear, but recovers as he mentions hearing his mother's voice among several, all asking for help. However, he feels jilted, as Kratos does not believe he heard his mother, nor wishes to help any voices. Relentlessly harassed by Dark Elves, the duo fights ancient stone golems and hack through hordes until they free the light and return it to the realm. Excitedly, Atreus hears the voice of his mother singing now within the light, but the searing beam burns him when he tries to enter. Telling him to stay here, Kratos hands him the axe, telling him to use it as a last resort, though his son is surprised he's even letting him hold it. Forcing his way into the beam, Kratos finds himself somewhere dark as Faye's ashes float away from him and he hears Atreus' resentful thoughts about his father, who was hardly around as he was growing up. However, he still admires and loves his father, just wishing he could be better, though is willing to try as long as he is too. Now seeing Faye in the light, Kratos reaches out but is pushed away as he is pulled out by Atreus. 
Though Kratos is mad at the boy, Atreus fires right back at his father for abandoning him again, and looking around, Kratos is in disbelief at the mounds of elves killed by the boy surrounding him, as his son tells him he was trapped in the light for a long time. Demanding to know why Kratos doesn't care, Kratos himself cannot find the words for a reply, looking at the Bifrost and thinking what just happened was impossible. Focusing back on why they came, Kratos infuses light into Atreus' bow, enabling them to navigate the city and return it back to the Light Elves after finishing off the leader of the Dark Elves who tells them they made a grave mistake in his dying breath. Returning back to the Black Breath, their light indeed pierces through the darkness, as within the mountain they find more giant made mechanisms and Kratos openly wonders why the passageways are all normal sized. Atreus laughs, saying it's a common misconception, and giants denote a race like elves and dwarves, and doesn't literally mean big people, though there are some giant giants, like the World Serpent. Ascending through the mines within the mountain, they kill another troll in their way, taking a lift to the top. However, right when they are about to reach the top, a burst of lightning coming from a dragon cuts their ride short. Its electricity detonates dangerous pockets of World Tree sap as well, as it turns its attention to Sindri, who happened to be nearby. Spurred to rescue him, Atreus offers to distract the dragon in order for Kratos to knock it off balance, and seeing how determined he is, the warrior decides to trust the boy's plan. Atreus' plan works, enabling him to rescue Sindri while Kratos leaps into the jaws of the dragon, hacking away inside. Using the World Tree sap as a bomb to shatter its armor, with Atreus' help, Kratos impales the dragon on a giant sap spike, blowing a hole through its neck and killing the massive beast. Sindri is not only amazed the pair slayed a dragon, but grateful they saved his life. Giving Atreus mistletoe arrows, he also uses a tooth from the dragon to enchant his bow with the power of lightning. With nothing stopping them from the summit now, they near their destination, as Atreus's quiver snaps and Kratos mends the strap with one of the mistletoe arrows. Climbing up, they overhear a conversation taking place and are surprised to hear Baldur among them. Listening in, they catch Baldur with the two sons of Thor, asking someone else where Kratos and the child he's traveling with are. After the trio leaves, Kratos reveals himself and the man in prison within a tree introduces himself as Mimir, the smartest man alive. However, even then, he doesn't know everything, such as why Baldur hunts them. After hearing of their journey here, he can, however, tell them the tallest peak in all the realms is not here in Midgard, but in Jotunheim, revealing to them the last bridge to that realm. However, the giants lock this route with a secret rune only another giant would know. As Kratos weighs this new information, Atreus affirms they need to go to Jotunheim now, and Mimir adds they will need his help. To this effect, Mimir tells him they need to cut off his head as his body cannot be freed and use old magic to resurrect him. Thinking the witch in the woods can help him, Mimir is ready to risk his life, knowing every day Odin tortures him to the point where he wishes he was dead already. Before Kratos takes his swing, Mimir whispers to Kratos he knows what Kratos and Atreus are. He states the longer Kratos waits to tell his son his true nature, the more damage he'll cause, as his mounting resentment may cause the father to lose his son forever. Kratos explains he doesn't want to tell his son everything about him, and countering Mimir questions if Kratos values his privacy over his own son. Without answering, Kratos cuts Mimir down to size with a decapitation, hanging him on his belt. Returning quickly to the Witch of the Woods, she is glad to see them again, but pauses when she sees the mistletoe arrows, quickly grabbing them, burning them, and strongly insisting to destroy any more of the wicked weapons if they see them again. She is further dismayed to see the dead head of Mimir when asked to revive him, but doing so as a favor, she succeeds in reanimating the head who recognizes her as the goddess Freya, former leader of the Vanir. Kratos is upset she didn't say she was a god before, and she checks him, pointing out he is in no position to talk. Storming out, Kratos tells Atreus they can no longer trust her, being a god, and focusing on their next step, Amir tells them to bring him before the world serpent named Jormungandr, as he is able to speak his ancient tongue. As they row out into the lake, Mimir regales them with a myriad of tales, but also reveals Baldur is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. Summoning the serpent, it first pauses to destroy the statue of Thor, and after Mimir explains things, Jormungandr apologizes for their loss and agrees to help. Mimir elaborates that they need two things in order to enter the land of the giants. The first is the travel rune to get there, and the other is a chisel able to actually carve it into the gateway. For now, he at least knows where the magic chisel they need is. He mentions it once belonged to the legendary stonemason giant Thamor, before Thor killed him, and the pair is surprised to see Sindri already there as well. Confused about how the dwarves move about unseen, Sindri explains to them that dwarves can simply step into the realm between realms, and because most things cannot understand seeing that, they don't see anything at all, though this trick doesn't seem to work with dragons. Thinking to smash the ice trapping the chisel, they bring down Thalmor's hammer, exposing the tip, but this disturbance has caught the attention of Thor's two sons, Magni and Modi. After taking down another troll, they are caught by the brothers, and the father and son are forced to team up for the 2v2. 
The brothers create a blinding storm around the two, targeting Atreus with inflammatory taunts to rile up the boy. Kratos does his best to cover for both of them, but Atreus still loses his cool and takes the bait. Quickly, Kratos splits Magni's skull open, and shocked to see this, Modi flees, warning them of the trouble they're in. A hot-headed Atreus begins coughing up blood as Kratos confirms his illness has returned. However, refusing to be a burden, he insists they focus on the task at hand, and agreeing, Kratos carves off a bit of the magic chisel, able to now crack the locks on magically sealed doors. Mimir notes that minor Aesir or not, killing Thor's son will not go over well in Asgard, but Kratos points out that they started it and he finished it, fearing no judgement for acting in self-defense. Though vengeance may be another issue, Atreus is simply amazed seeing his father killing a god in the first place. With the chisel in hand, the group is able to remove the magic lock on Tyr's vault beneath his golden temple in the lake, and immediately they are surprised to find a giant shrine about Tyr, but the middle panel is missing. Mimir adds that though Tyr was a god, he was loved by the giants as well, and was the only other one besides him gifted with their special sight. Seeing another sandbowl, Atreus offers to teach Kratos how to read and write their tongue, and Kratos receives the lesson well until he is struck by a sneak attack by Modi. Caught in a web of lightning, Kratos struggles against his bonds as a rage-filled Atreus begins pulsating with a new power too strong for his body to contain as he knocks himself out. Bursting into a rage of his own, Kratos breaks free of Modi, knocking him back and sending him running away again as he quickly tends to Atreus who looks deathly pale. Urging Kratos to take him to Freya quickly, Mimir theorizes that he's seen issues of the mind manifesting as ailments of the body, and while it's not usually the case for gods, wonders if it's because in this case a god may be believing himself mortal. Banging on Freya's door and bellowing for her help, Freya ignores Kratos until he says Atreus is ill. Now opening her door, she recognizes the unusual illness as his true nature fighting within him, and helpless, Kratos asks for help. Obliging, Freya says she needs a rare ingredient, the heart of the Keeper that protects the bridge of the damned in Helheim. Though he has been to the Underworld, just not this Underworld, Freya tells him the Norse Realm of the Dead is an icy one where no fire can be started and his frost axe will be useless. Thinking of what else he can use, Kratos has an idea but it would mean digging into a past he swore would stay buried. Freya reminds him Atreus is not his past, but his son who needs his father. Freya then shows him the rune to enter Helheim, and as he turns to leave, Kratos pauses to apologize for his words and deeds last time, but she stops him, agreeing he is right to not trust the word of a god. Taking a magic boat ride straight home, Kratos is now deep in thought as his past as the god of war returns to haunt him with a vision of Athena. At home, he unearths and unwraps the Blades of Chaos, rebinding the chains to himself as the ghost of Athena speaks to the ghost of Sparta, mocking him for trying to run from his past and deny who he truly is by pretending to be a good teacher, husband, and father. She tells him he will always be a monster and he cannot change that, and Kratos says that's true, but he is not her monster anymore. Seeing the Blazing Blades in action, Mimir confirms they will work just fine in Helheim, correctly guessing Kratos to be Greek from his utterances with Athena earlier. Passing by Brock, the dwarf is impressed by the blades as well, but when hearing Atreus has fallen sick, Kratos admits it's his fault for the cause and his responsibility to make right. Stepping into the bitter cold, Mimir mentions hell is a place for those who do not ascend into Valhalla for dying dishonorably, as Kratos confronts the gatekeeper who is yet another troll and carves out his heart. Hearing his name being called out, Kratos is shocked to see a vision of Zeus in Helheim as he mentions to Mimir that Zeus was his father, who is almost unsurprised to hear this. He tells Kratos to calm down, assuring him it's just an illusion of Helheim torturing its victims with their past. They are interrupted by Brock, who upgrades the Blades of Chaos to be able to manipulate the winds of Hell, and with this, he hurries back as Mimir advises Kratos he should be honest about his past and lineage to Atreus. Returning to Freya, she uses the heart to break Atreus's fever, but in order to heal, she affirms that Kratos needs to tell him the truth about what he is. She knows it can be hard, as she too has a son, though it's been a long time since she's seen him. When he was born, the runes foretold he would die a needless death, and as a mother, she did everything she could to protect him, no matter the sacrifice. However, part of her choice was to protect her needs and fears too, and she could not see his resentment of her over protection until it was too late. She tells him not to make the same mistake as her and to believe in his son, and Kratos replies both he and also Atreus are cursed, and at this moment Atreus wakes up claiming to be better and ready to travel. With this, Kratos shakes Freya's hand as thanks, telling her he won't forget his favor, and the two return to Tyr's vault to find the Black Rune. Along the way, Kratos knows the boy overheard his talk with Freya, and Atreus states he heard Kratos say he was cursed. Clarifying what he meant, Kratos reveals he is a god from a distant land, and since coming here has tried to be a mortal man but sees nothing can change the truth that he was born a god, just like Atreus. Unsure of what to say in response, the boy's first question is if he can turn into an animal, but Kratos doesn't believe so. 
Kratos adds his mother was mortal but knew of his true nature and had hoped to spare him the knowledge as being a god can be a lifetime of pain and sadness, which is the curse he spoke of. The boy thinks this is why he can hear voices others cannot, and Mimir confirms every god is unique, and Atreus wonders how many others knew he was a god, wondering if this is why Baldur was after them. Excited about the revelation of godhood, Atreus reflects on their actions so far, now with an air of conceit, and Mimir advises him to dial it down a bit. As they descend into the temple, Mimir shares that Tyr was a god of war, but one who fought for peace, using his power to stop wars over starting them. They observe that Tyr traveled to many lands and cultures, learning from each so as to gain wisdom, versus Odin who sought to hoard knowledge. As Tyr earned the love of many, Odin began to see him as a threat, also suspecting him of collaborating with the giants against him, though it was true Tyr helped out the giants and likely covered their tracks to Jotunheim. Within the vault, they see the many gifts and treasures Tyr has collected worldwide, like Egypt, as Kratos is surprised to see some souvenirs from Greece as well, smelling some wine that reminds him of home, but shocked to see a vase depicting him. They also see a large mural of the wolf giants who begin Ragnarok when they catch the sun and moon, but this leads to a trap where Freya's protection room is erased and a spike ceiling threatens to turn Kratos into a sandwich. Quickly solving the puzzle and seeing a way to break the trap, Atreus thinks to use his mother's knife to jam the gears to break the mechanism, losing the knife but saving his father, and Kratos approves of his decision making under pressure. He hands him a replacement knife, saying on the day he was born he made two knives mixing metal from this land and his homeland, one for him and one for Atreus when he was ready. Kratos tells Atreus he's ready now, and he's not just a man but something more than that with a greater responsibility, telling his son to be better than him. Now trusting his son, Kratos claims the runestone but sees it's blank, tossing it to Atreus when it suddenly lights up, revealing the rune to him. After defeating not one but two more trolls, the duo sits down and Kratos pulls out the Lemnian wine he found earlier, which is from an island near where he was born, and shares a drink with his son, content in the moment. However, Atreus asks him why he left his old land and came to Midgard, wondering if it had something to do with the gods there due to his hatred of gods, but Kratos doesn't answer. The boy personally thinks there are good gods, like Tyr and Kratos, believing in him and thinking he only killed those deserving, and after a pause, Kratos affirms this, though Mimir jabs at who is the judge. Moving on, Kratos tells Atreus to keep his identity as a god a secret, telling him there is wisdom and discretion, but Atreus begins to show an arrogant streak to his friends like Sindri, as his attitude seems to also gather literal storm clouds. Kratos warns him there is also little to be gained from being unkind to others, but the boy dismisses the notion flippantly. The duo notice the magic seal and break it, finding a Valkyrie in prison for some reason, though it goes berserk and attacks them. Destroying the formidable foe, the spirit of the Valkyrie is released, thanking them for defeating her corrupted form, and asking them to free her sisters similarly trapped. Considering this, as they return to the mountain, they are met by a gravely injured Modi who gripes how his father Thor blamed him and then beat him for what happened to Magni. Atreus jeers at him, but Kratos tells him to stop as he is already defeated and not worth killing. Going against his wishes, Atreus feels as a god he can do what he wants and stabs Modi in the neck to finish him and kicks him over for insulting his mother. Grabbing him, Kratos tells his son he has lost control again and there are consequences for killing a god, but the boy shoots back by asking Kratos how he would even know that and Kratos hesitates to answer. Atreus presses further, asking about where the blades came from, why he hid them, and thinks he probably used them to kill a god before, asking who else and how many he killed before Magni. Kratos replies they will not be having this discussion, as the two reach the top of the mountain, inscribe the rune, and finally open the way to Jotunheim. However, they are ambushed by Baldur and Wade, who pins Kratos against the gate, and in their struggle, they destroy their door to Jotunheim. Kratos tells Atreus to run, but the boy declares he's a god too and can fight, though when Kratos pushes back too hard, Atreus shoots Kratos with one of his magic arrows, stunning him. Laughing at their infighting, Baldur easily snatches away Atreus, stabbing him with his own knife after a pathetic charge. Leaping after them, Kratos lands on the dragon Baldur is riding away on, and though they slug it out, Baldur knocks Kratos off and lands on the temple, with the warrior not far behind. Baldur hurries to activate the bridge to Asgard, but blocking him, Kratos uses his Bifrost to open the door to Helheim and suck them all in, knocking Baldur away and sending Kratos and Atreus deeper into Hell. Once they are settled, Kratos sternly lectures his son again on his recent bad attitude, selfish actions, and brazen recklessness that got them into this situation and puts him in his place. Helheim also plays back Atreus' regretful words and deeds as the boy acknowledges the mistakes he's made and pledges to do better. Beyond, they also spy Baldur facing his own ghosts as they not only learn his mother is Freya, but she also casts a spell of invulnerability on her son, which he hates as it also meant he never felt anything bad or good for himself. 
However, his regret is actually that he never killed his mother, hating her for being unable and unwilling to lift the spell herself. Slipping by him, they find a boat to sail back to the temple with, and even manage to make it fly in a sort of way, but this time they see another illusion from Kratos' past where he faces Zeus. Atreus sees his father kill his grandfather, but also see their ship is about to crash, as they abandon ship and smash into another secret chamber of Odin's, where they find where Odin was looking into Jotunheim. They find the missing panel from the giant shrine from Tyr's temple, where they see Tyr traveling around magically, surrounded by different symbols from different cultures, including Greece, that all mean war. Thanks to Mimir's gifted sight like Tears, he can see a secret path and plan made by Tyr involving a key they must make and the head suggests they ask the dwarves. Along the way, Kratos begins to explain what Atreus saw in Hell with Zeus, but the boy pretends he saw nothing and so Kratos drops it. At the same time, the warrior deduces someone, either Freya or Odin, enchanted Mimir to neither recall that Baldur was Freya's son nor reveal Baldur's weakness, which means he has one they need to figure out. Reviewing what they know, Baldur is Odin's best tracker, which means that if Baldur is tracking them, it's because Odin wants them. Unfortunately, Brock doesn't see the means to make one, though Sindri pops in, presenting a solution to not only craft it, but provides the raw material for it, which surprises and delights his brother. Sindri is likewise impressed Brock has innovated some of his forging methods and expanded his level of thinking, and together the brothers resolve their dispute and forge the key they need while reforging their bond. Returning to Tyr's vault to find his hidden room, they find they need to flip the temple upside down to access his secret treasure, which Mimir is shocked to see is the fabled Unity Stone. With this relic, Tyr was able to visit all the realms and outside lands as well, making a new path in the realm between realms. He also just recalls the World Serpent said he knew Atreus, even though that seems impossible, theorizing that it's said when Thor and the Serpent clashed during Ragnarok, they splinter the World Tree, throwing the Serpent back into the past before his own birth, so it may be true somehow. Speaking of, Odin himself is convinced the giants hold the key to changing his fate when Ragnarok comes, as their army is supposed to defeat him. With the Unity Stone in hand, the group takes a leap of faith off the edge of the Realm Between Realms, indeed finding another path at Jotunheim. After defeating another troll, they restore the gate in Midgard proper, but without a travel crystal they lack a means to form a bridge, as Tyr used his own magic eyes to refract the energy. With both of his eyes, Mimir could do the same, but Odin plucked one of his eyes precisely so he couldn't travel. Thinking to consult the dwarves, they mention around the time Odin took Mimir's eye is when he also asked the dwarves to make him a statue of Thor with a hidden compartment in it for the lake, but they declined. The statue still got built, but it was the one Jormungandr swallowed earlier. Speaking to the World Serpent, he believes it's still in his stomach, opening his mouth for them to look around for themselves. On the way over, the duo free all of the Valkyries, defeating Sigrun, who reveals Freya was the queen of the Valkyries, but after Odin severed her wings, he then used magic to corrupt all the Valkyries. After she blesses them, they enter the World Serpent and locate Mimir's missing eye, though on the way out, something knocks over the World Serpent, forcing it to spit them out near the body of the giant stonemason. Strangely, Freya is also here, in the form of a falcon, as she says she's looking for her son, feeling inspired after seeing Kratos and Atreus work things out. They are interrupted by Baldur, who was the one attacking Jormungandr as a way to bring the two out, and Freya calls out to her son. Glad to see his mother, Baldur moves to kill her, though Kratos intervenes and Freya wants them both to stop fighting as she binds down Kratos. Atreus steps in to protect his father and stands his ground against Baldur, taking a direct hit from him. However, as it turns out, Baldur ends up stabbing his hand on the mistletoe arrow Kratos used to fix his son's quiver, and the cursed arrow removes all of Freya's wards on the god, rendering him vulnerable. Feeling pain for the first time, Baldur is overjoyed to feel anything and everything again, but panicking, Freya now binds him and animates the dead giant to protect her son and give her a chance to reason with him. Freya declares she would rather die than let her son die first, but Baldur is more focused on fighting Kratos as though he is vulnerable, he is no less powerful and dangerous, trading blows with the god of war. Atreus keeps up with the battle as well as he perfectly synchronizes with Kratos' barrage and calls upon the world serpent, speaking its tongue to get rid of the giant interfering with their battle. The father-son tag team overwhelms and defeats Baldur, who tells them to kill him, though Freya begs them not to, and Atreus affirms he's not a threat anymore. Letting him off with a firm warning, Kratos releases Baldur, who spits back Freya's pleading for a fresh start, saying he'll never forgive her for the lifetime she stole from him. She says if seeing her dead will make him happy, then she is glad to do so, and accepting her offer, Baldur begins to strangle her as she tells him she still loves him. However, refusing to stand by, Kratos grabs away Baldur, who wonders why Kratos couldn't leave them be, and the warrior tells him what his father Zeus once told him, that the cycle must end, adding his own advice of being better, snapping Baldur's neck quickly. 
Shocked and in grief, Freya swears vengeance on Kratos for killing her son regardless of circumstance. She wonders if Atreus knows how cruel and violent his father is, and in response, Kratos tells his son his tale. Hailing from the land of Sparta, he made a deal with a god that cost him his soul and killed many, deserving and undeserving, including his own father. Atreus wonders if this is what it means to be a god, with sons killing their parents, but Kratos tells him who he is is not who Atreus will be, and can choose to be better. As Freya walks away, Kratos says that as a parent he understands her anger, and if it was the other way around, he would let Atreus kill him too if it meant saving him, and Mimir advises they just give her time and space. Now using Mimir as a focus, their idea works as the two finally open the way to Jotunheim and see it drops them off right at the peak of the giant's fingers. Acknowledging that they did it, Kratos begins to unwrap his bandages, claiming he has nothing more to hide, and allows his son to carry his mother's ashes for the final steps, recognizing he's earned it. As they enter a shrine, they see multiple carvings of various giants, but strangely, no actual surviving giants here. Upon Atreus' touch, another mural reveals itself, where they see Faye with her axe in the past arguing with the giants. They also see themselves in this prophecy, speaking with the world serpent as they had, as well as their battle with the dragon, the stonemason, and even Baldur. Kratos corrects him, saying this actually depicts Atreus' story, realizing Faye was keeping the secret she was a giant from him this whole time, and the boy realizes this makes him half-god, half-giant. Kratos realizes this must be why she sent them here after she died to see this prophecy, and Faye was the real target of Baldur all along. Atreus is amazed this prophecy has been correct, but staying behind, Kratos looks to the panel for the future, silently taking in a scene of him dying in Atreus' arms. Together, the two scatter face ashes to the winds, as Atreus thinks the giants are all gone. Their journey complete, Atreus says there is still one part of the wall he finds confusing, as they had referred to him as Loki, and Kratos replies that was the name his mother wanted for him when he was born. Kratos says he chose the name Atreus after a Spartan he knew who smiled even during the worst of times, inspiring them to hope and remember their humanity, who sacrificed himself to turn the tide of a battle in their favor. As the game ends, Mimir warns them that with Baldur's death begins an ominous winter that will span for three years, followed by Ragnarok, which is per prophecy, but this was not supposed to happen for at least another century. Brock confirms he feels this to be the onset of Fimble Winter, and Mimir mentions Freya visited him to learn where Odin kept her stolen Valkyrie wings, intending to return to her warrior ways. Finally back home, the first thing the two do is go to sleep, but as he dreams, Atreus has a vision of a stormy visitor who turns out to be none other than Thor. The next morning, he shares his vision with his father, telling him it feels like the future, and as the sun rises on a new day, the warrior begins to focus on what they can do today. God of War 2018 has enjoyed the success of selling over 23 million copies worldwide. Thanks for watching the video, what did you think of the new direction for the series? If you enjoyed the recap, then leave a like and big thanks to the patron and channel member warriors. Links are in the description for how to support the channel and get extra videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next battlefield.